um, possibly be po possibly be the before last seminar of the year in our in our South American webinar. Uh, today we are very pleased to have uh, Lohan Speranza again, since uh, we, we had an emergency earlier on this term and we couldn't have had his talk in August. So we're finally uh, having access to that content. We're very pleased to, to, to finally be able to, to hear him. Uh, Lohan is going to be telling us about uh, homogeneous Ricci flow and its collapses. And with a number of collaborators, maybe you want to expand. Some of them are very known to people here. <laughs> All right, please, Lohan. Uh, let's do 50 minutes and then, and then questions, if that's okay. Okay. Thank I'll you let you know much. five minutes, five minutes ahead of time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very cool. much for the invitation. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I beg your pardon for the last time I couldn't make it. Uh, it was a, a troublesome time in life. <laughs> so I am very pleased to talk to you about uh, a little bit of homogeneous jet flow and uh, mostly collapses of homogeneous metrics in some homogeneous manifold. This is a joint work with half of Unicamp. It's a joke. With these four <laughs> collaborators, uh, Lino and Ricardo from Unicamp, and uh, Mauro Patrão and Lucas Seco from uh, University of Brasilia. Uh, I should start talking a little bit about the Ricci flow. I'm sure everyone's very familiar with the concept of it, at least. So uh, this is quite intuitive thing to do, uh, at least for a student of Ullenbeck, is that uh, you, for example, if you start with an open domain Rn and you take the temperature function, right? So the function that gives you the temperature. Uh, so if you have some initial condition, then uh, you can just let the temperature, I don't know, flow. So the heat flows, right? And uh, this flow is modeled by this equation, which is called the heat equation, right? So usually it goes, uh, the T, when T goes to infinity, uh, roughly speaking, the derivative goes to zero. So you get some kind of equilibrium state. So if this goes to zero, it means that this goes to zero very um, uh, roughly speaking. So the equilibrium state is something like a, a ho not homogeneous, but a harmonic function. Uh, rich flow, it tries to do the same. So you have the metric and you have something very that resembles much the Laplacian of the, the, the metric, which is the Ricci curvature. Yeah, so you do the same. You make your metric flow as minus two, the Ricci curvature. And uh, its equilibrium states are Einstein metrics. So metrics where the Ricci tensor is just a multiple of the metric tensor. And uh, it has a short time existence, which is very good but it is not really like a heaty flow in in the real world it uh, it it collapses it extincts uh i don't know shit happens yeah so roughly <laughs> speaking or not uh, and this is characterized by the curvature blowing up so the curvature tensor uh, very often uh, curvature gets concentrated and uh, the curvature tensor blows up. And uh, so the Ricci flow, the flow itself, it tries to 
make the rich curvature more homogeneous, more spread homogeneously everywhere along the manifold, but it find obstacles and these obstacles uh, bring us to what we call collapses and uh, later on surgeries. So putting in a picture, I uh, stole this picture from Morgan Tiang, uh, their famous book, The Rich Flow and Poincaré Conjecture. So we start with a generic manifold and uh, the rich flow tries to make more homogeneous, make more spread the curvature. Homogeneous is not the right word here because we use homogeneous very soon. But sometimes curvature gets concentrated uh, and you get a very thin neck, yeah? Something like this. And this neck, it just uh, collapses to a point. So what you do, like uh, in Bellman's proof of Poincaré conjecture, when you get this neck, you cut along it and uh, let the flow goes uh, after this cut, after this surgery. Uh, it doesn't happen in homogeneous flows for one specific reason. So the richer flow has this very good habit of uh, preserving isometry groups. So if you start with a metric with certain symmetries, with a group G, G of symmetries, then this group uh, acts as by isometries in the in every solution of the rich flow. So at every T in the solution of the rich flow. Yeah. And this is very easy to prove. It comes from uniqueness of solution. And uh, so if you have a, and the, the invariance of the rich tensor by the homomorphism. So you just pull back the metric and you see, oh, we, so we are starting with the same metric. So it must be the same solution. Okay, I'm not going into details here. Uh, and as a corollary, uh, naturally, we have that if we started with a homogeneous manifold, then uh, the whole flow is through homogeneous metrics. So if G0 is a homogeneous metric, then GT is homogeneous for every T, which is pretty nice because homogeneous metrics, they are uh, very much characterized uh, by its value in one point. Yeah, so we start our favorite point in here. We pick our favorite point in the manifold and do all calculations in this single point, which makes also uh, the flow to be an ordinary differential equation, not anymore a part of differential equation. So yeah. can, I, can I just ask you a philosophical question, right? So if you're flowing among, among isometric manifolds, then what you're really looking for at the limit is some sort of algebraic phenomenon, right? Uh, because, they're, they're, I mean, they're all isometric, but the sort of group action, right? The, 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 the group action may sort of may collapse, right? That it's a, it's a, it has a sort of algebraic nature in the homogeneous case, isn't it? Or it's not really a geometric well, phenomenon, right? Because so they're uh, they are not, the flow is not true isometric manifolds. They are all homogeneous manifolds, but the metric changes. We will have oh, pictures very soon, so that will okay. be clear. Ah, so the isometry group may actually increase, right? The isometry uh, group, yes, it might increase. Um, and okay. actually, this is what you do in two dimensions. So it make like positive scalar curvature in round spheres. So it, it certainly yeah. increase, but uh, uh, this is not the point here. The point is that we are not true isometric manifolds. So GT, Indeed. yeah, so M, G0 and M G epsilon, they will not be isometric, but they might have the same isometry group. Ah, fair enough. Okay, good, good. Sorry. Yeah, I think I misunderstood what you said. Yeah, of course. Good. Yes. Thank you. Yes, but thank you for the question. And please interrupt me because I can make these misunderstandings uh, through, through the, <laughs> the rest of the talk. So if something's not clear, uh, don't hesitate. Cool. And Paolo Piccioni is not here 
to make questions, so please make questions in his name also. Yeah, you're please. safe. I'm here in his name. Don't Lohan? worry. Lohan? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, may I ask you something? So, um, yeah. I think that in the homogeneous case, the isometric group is exactly the same for on for for any time because it doesn't increase. no no it can't because mm -hmm. since it's an ODE you all you always have solutions backward and then sure. you apply you apply backward and then it cannot increase just in the in the limit but for any it's exactly the same yes the yes group. in the homogeneous case yes i yes yes that, that's very very good very consistent constant consistent thank you very much and indeed even the example i said that uh, it uh, makes positive scalar curvature in low dimension around sphere this is in the limit it's only on the limit that it's around sphere so even in this example well talking like this the isometric group ju just increased in the limit so yes this is completely consistent and uh yes uh sorry for that i also want to mean the limit yes so we have backward flows also uh in the homogeneous case being an od uh yes so homogeneous space we do geometry at the point uh with if we start with a manifold g over h so we have a we will deal with compact Lie groups here, so it's compact homogeneous space, and I will write compact here before uh, someone who who knows homogeneous flows much more than me <laughs> thinks that I, I'm doing something much different. Different. So we start with a G compact Lie group and a closed subgroup H. And uh, we'll fix a uh, beam variant metric B uh, just for notation. And uh, so we can pick up uh, our favorite point in M. So like if we take the identity on G, it uh, projects to the class of the identity. And uh, the tangent space of M is uh, naturally identified with this m here so the Lie algebra g it breaks as the Lie algebra of the isotropy group sorry the Lie algebra of h plus some complement a b orthogonal complement and this b orthogonal complement uh, is naturally uh, identified with the tangent of m at the uh, class of the identity Moreover, uh, since H, uh, you want H to act as isometries on, on G uh, for the metric to be, for the metric in M to be G invariant. So this M, the, the H acts on g by the adjoint action and this m will be a, a dgh invariant and you can break it in modules more than this uh, many in many cases in interesting cases at least are interesting metrics on this guy here on the m on this guy here are called diagonal metrics. So there are, for example, what you call flag manifolds, or more general, if the rank of G is equal to the rank of H, then all metrics are of this form. So there will be only multiples of our bi-invariant metric restricted to each one of these modules here. So this happens because these modules, in, with this rank condition, these modules are pairwise non-isomorphic. So by Schur's lemma, uh, 
the metric must be like this because it must be a d g h invariant. Mm -hmm. And if the metric is like this, the Ricci curvature will be diagonal also. And uh, because everything is diagonal, uh, even the Ricci flow will be invariant through diagonal metrics. Uh, so the subset of diagonal metrics is Ricci flow invariant. Yeah, so again, we have this uh, dictionary, so a gene variant metric on M. It is uh, completely uh, characterized by its value on the tangent of a single point on M. And this is can be uh, translated to a ADGH invariant inner product on M, on this M here, right? And uh, the other way around also works. If we start with this guy here, we get the gene variant metric on M. And for algebraic reasons, uh, we deal with this slide here. Yeah. So if we are with this side, we end up in, with an ordinary differential equation. So the Ricci is calculated in a single point and the matrix is calculated in a single point. And now the whole uh, geometry doesn't depend anymore in a complicated way in the whole manifold as the Laplacian does, the heat flow with the Laplacian does. If you think on heat, so if you have uh, the heat distributed in different ways, uh, all heat in the room will influence every point, every single point in the room. Yeah, so it's a very global phenomena. Here, everything is. Uh, uh, Characterized in one single point. It's very nice for calculations. Uh, however, we have some, there are many difficulties with Ricci flow, of course, even the homogeneous case. And uh, my collaborators, they wanted very much to make a natural compactification of the Ricci flow. And the reason is the following. Uh, for example, let's take M with only two summands. So you have only two and with diagonal matrix. So your matrix is just X times B on the M1 plus Y times B on M2. Yeah, so it happens on the positive quadrant the in the plane. Yeah, so the Ricci flow can be very, um, well, it can behave very arbitrarily here. Yeah, it can goes up, it can hit here maybe, maybe it could go down, I don't know. And uh, usually you have a lot of problems like uh, when it hits here, you have collapses, yeah? So when it hits one of the axes, it means this axis here, it means that uh, X, X is going to zero, right? So if X is going to zero, it means that your matrix is not a metric anymore. It becomes the generate. And what study, instead of studying what is happening here, it's very common that you do a volume normalized Ricci flow. So you stay only in metrics uh, which a constant volume. Yeah, so you can take your, your Ricci flow and change it like this. So you modify the Ricci flow instead of using only this, you add one more term. And this magic formula here makes your reach flow, the volume of the solution to be constant along the solution of the reach flow. And so going back to this picture here, 
to have a constant volume here, it means something quite related to x time y to be constant. Yeah, let's say x y time y to be one, something like this. So you are moving in a hyperbole. And hyperbole, as we know, they are not very compact things, right? So if you deal with limits, uh, you can just go to infinity like that. Or maybe you, you, uh, your limit is in one point, right? And uh, their idea is not to use the the hyperbole well you could use the hyperbole but if you do some calculations and that's what they that what they did uh, you can use actually every, any degree any homogeneous function to normalize your Ricci flow to normalize your homogeneous Ricci flow yeah so if you start with a, hom a degree alpha homogeneous function, so homogeneous, homogeneous in the sense that this alpha goes out, so alpha d, sorry, alpha was a horrible choice here. So lambda x, it goes lambda alpha to omega x. Uh, then you can change your homogeneous Ricci flow like this. So you add this term here. And uh, when you see the solution of this guy here, the solution of this equation here, then W of GT will be constant. Yeah, so if GT is a solution of this equation here, then W of GT will be constant. So if we start equal to one, it will keep equal to one. Let's see like this, let's say like this. Uh, moreover, uh, the solutions of this equation, and this is the main part, they are just uh, reparameterized solutions and uh, projected somehow solutions of the Ricci flow. Yeah, so we are talking dynamic wise, we are talking about the same uh, dynamics, but now we are restricting to the level set W equal to one. And we can take this W very simple. For example, if we take W of X is the sum of the coordinates, then w equals to one in the positive quadrant is just this simplex here yeah so this this figure here you should interpret as diagonal matrix uh, with three parameters so you are uh, reducing these three parameters to x plus y plus z equal to one so you can take out the z let's say and, uh, but x plus y plus z equal to one, being all of them positive, it's just this simplex here, the simplex t. So you get this triangle here. Yeah, and now uh, this triangle with the boundary, it is compact. And this is very nice because if you take a, a sequence, it will converge, uh, a subsequence will converge. Right. Yes. So we will fort, further use not only T, but also this triangle downstairs here, just for convenience. So we can some drawings here, some pictures. We will restrict ourselves also uh, to flag manifolds with three isotrop summons. Uh, because we, some results of us are general, like this projectivization and the collapsing result. Uh, but the rest we will do with three isotropic summons. So it means that our M, it breaks in three 
uh, irreducible modules and our metrics, since they are flag manifolds, the rank is the same and uh, the metrics will be diagonal like this. So we write x1, x2, x3 and uh, since we are normalizing in this simplex, and think of x3 as x1 minus x1 minus x2, right? So we are really on this picture here. We are living in this picture here, okay? And our flow will be in this triangle. And uh, these flag manifolds with three isotropic summons, they are characterized by their second bet number. So they are called type one if second bet number is equal to one and type two if the second bet number is equal to two. Or it is also characterized by the number of positive roots. Yeah, which is the same number as the B2. Okay. So it has its specific construction. Um, if you are in Unicamp, some years ago, you will be certainly be hearing about uh, parabolic subgroups and the uh, flag manifolds or generalized flag manifolds. And you take the parabolic subgroup and quotient and you get the flag manifold. But maybe uh, these days in Unicamp, G2 things are more common. And this is Enrique's fault, right, Enrique? Uh, flag oh. manifolds, parabolic subgroups, and G2 are all friends. All friends, yeah, of all course, friends. of course. It's a, a big group <laughs> hug, yeah. Great, great, good to say, good to know. <laughs> yes, so uh, these manifolds, they are pretty much um, classified. Sorry, some words are leaving my brain. And uh, so the type one flag manifolds, so these ones, they are more of exotic type. So they are made of exceptional groups mostly, and they have exactly three Einstein metrics, three invariant Einstein metrics. One of them exactly is Einstein color and the others are not color. Okay, so we are talking about these manifolds here. This D1, D2, D3 are the dimensions of M1, M2, M M3. Okay, and you can see that there are pretty big guys here, but they all have uh, the same dynamics as we will see soon. And the type two manifolds, they are more classical guys. So they are just uh, really what we, you would expect of being a flag manifolds, just uh, a subspace inside of subspace, uh, both on the SU or an SO, and there is this E6 as well. Uh, so one very good example here, I think it is SU3 by U1, U1, U1. Yeah, so it's essentially SU3 by U1, U1, more or less, yeah. Oh my God, what have I done? Uh, here. Okay, and this, these manifolds, they have four invariant metrics. Yeah, and again, one of them, exactly one is Einstein color, the others are not color. And the, uh, one of our results, it's about the dynamics of the Ricci flow. So the result is that it's not only the Einstein metrics that are the same, like the number and the number of Einstein color, but the dynamics of each type is the same as well. It depends of which manifold we are taking here, it depends of the dimensions, or it depends of each manifold that you take here. Okay, they all have uh, the same dynamics uh, up to a conjugation, up to a diffeomorphism. Yeah. 
And this is type two. These are the classical guys. And this is type one. And here in these pictures, we see very interesting things. Uh, first, in the type two, you really have some symmetric, uh, a symmetric view here. And uh, this triangle is the triangle downstairs, is the S triangle that you see there. But if you put on T, this triangle here is even isosceles triangle. Uh, these angles are the same. This is a very nice picture. Uh, very symmetrical, and the four Einstein matrix are here. So one, two, sorry, this is one, two, three, four. And this is the Einstein color, which is very nice also. And you can see that uh, all they are all saddle points, the non-color metric and the Einstein color metric, it is, um, uh, repulsive point, so it is taking away all the all the flows. Yeah, the flows are going away from it. Uh, repulsor, I'm sorry. I... So here also the the Einstein color metric. I think I think you can just call it a source, right? A source. It's the opposite yeah. of source. Uh, well, no, it's uh, every, all the fields are emanating from it, right? Oh, so it's a source, yeah. It's a source Otherwise, and it would be, yeah? be a sink. Yeah, it's a, a sink. Yeah. Great, no, it's a source. It be, yeah, it's a source. Great, thank you very much. So, Lohan, I think I am, Lohan, yes. It's, it's a local minimum for the scalar curvature, right? That's why it's, it's repelling. The Einstein color is a local minimum. In that case, in type two, yes, it's a local minimum of the scalar curvature, and your flow is essentially the the gradient flow for the scalar yes. curvature. So that's why it's, it's it's like that. This is very nice to know. Thank you very much. Is it in general a local minimum? The Einstein no, no. color. In type one is a local maximum. Only this one. In in type in here, one, on the, the right you uh -huh. get the local maximum yes that's here why is it yeah and that's why it's an, a, attracting everything because it's a local maximum jorge but in this case how do you interpret the uh the unstable points what what do they mean regarding regarding the, the scalar curvature well the they are subtle subtle points they, they have positive and negative directions for for the hessian just that mm. The, the unstable ones. Mm. I mean, well, the local minimum is, in particular, very unstable, right? Uh, very stable. You mean the, the, the local minimum? No, un unstable. The, the the stable here is local maximum. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. Okay. It's right. minus a gradient. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so so okay okay so it's super unstable. Yeah. It's un in every direction. Yeah. Yes, cool, cool, cool. Yes. Cool. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have these nice pictures here, but uh, the main point I would like to talk, it's about the other points, not the Einstein manifolds, but these ones. And one, two. So, uh, homogeneous rich flow or ever rich flow, one of the main aspects of it is the limit. Limit. So, if the limit doesn't collapse, it means it, it, it doesn't degenerate somehow, then in the end, uh, you hope to have an Einstein metric. And I think this is always true for homogeneous manifolds. Uh, however, it's not what happens all the time, right? If you remember the surgery picture before, uh, the curvature could concentrate in some point, and then to it is common that you would like to keep with the flow, so you cut off that part and you keep with the flow. 
uh, here it doesn't happen like this. It doesn't concentrate in one point because the matrix is homogeneous. So it concentrates in some direction in the whole manifold. Yeah. So these directions, it finds some uh, sub-bundle of the tangent bundle. And uh, indeed, it defines a subgroup, these directions. And uh, so this whole subgroup uh, on G, it will collapse. So not only G over H that you have in the end, but in the limit, limiting uh, metric, you have a, a bigger quotient. So some G over Q, some G over K. K. Uh, where K is a subgroup that contains H. Uh, however, uh, so uh, these four collaborators of mine, they, Lucas Seco invited me to Brasilia once and started to talk about it. So he hired me to do the metric geometry part. So collapses and collapses uh, we did in no, more general form. So I think that this theorem is interesting by itself. I'm not really know. I don't really know if this was known or not, but uh, I like it very much. So, so if you have, for example, you think of your matrix here. Yeah, you have type one of type two, three summons manifold. And you have your your simplex of matrix, which lives in the positive quadrant of R three. Yeah, so matrix, they are diagonal matrix with three uh, factors. So here are your three factors summing one. And now you take a limit here. Yeah, and a sequence here. You take a sequence here, and the sequence uh, will have some limit, at least the subsequence of it. So it will have some uh, some relating point. And uh, you would like to know, well, yes, if you have a, a sequence that converts to a point in the interior, you have no problem. This is just another metric in G over H. But if it, reaches, if it reaches the boundary, so in the boundary here, so if we write x, y, and z, in the boundary here, here y is 0, okay? here x is 0, here x plus y is equal to 1, in this, this line here, therefore z is 0. So all the boundary here, things are uh, collapsing, right? Somehow. And uh, it's very interesting now to ask, ask ourselves what happens in this collapse. And uh, if you go for that, if you look at that, uh, then something very interesting happens and it doesn't depend on on the flow, it's not related to the flow, it's just sequence of metrics, is that the, the limiting, the gromov hausdorff limit of a sequence, it just doesn't depend on the, on the sequence that you take. And this is very interesting uh, because you are just giving a meaning to this point where z is zero. So you can just take a metric x, y, zero, in your homogeneous manif manifold, and I'm telling you that it has a meaning. So it, it doesn't have a meaning as a metric in G over H. Well, it's a sub Riemannian metric, of course, but as uh, in the Gromov Hausdorff sense, if you take a sequence that goes to this metric here, the metric spaces with the, with the geodesic, the path distance will converge to whatever you collapse here. So this M3 here that is collapsing, maybe it's a subalgebra and it generates uh, your K, not on, 
not M3 is a subalgebra, but M3 plus the H here you must consider, yeah? So maybe this thing is a subalgebra, so it generates a subgroup. Group. Maybe it's not a subalgebra, so you must take brackets of it. And what, how many brackets as you need, right? And uh, so this will generate some subgroup eventually. And this whole thing will collapse, yeah? And uh, will collapse uh, sometimes if things are very good with this subgroup. So in your sequence, it converges, the remaining of the sequence converges to something which is K invariant, then it's Riemannian, otherwise, no, it's Finsler. And, and this was very cool just to, that Finsler matrix appeared like this in a very natural way. Uh, and I heard somewhere that the Gromov Hauser limits, it's expected to have Finsler matrix. So if you see this Finsler matrix here, this Finsler matrix here, I don't know many properties of it, uh, but uh, it, if you look at it, it really looks nice. Yeah? So I showed it to Carlos Duran, who is quite a specialist in Finsler manifolds, and he called it neat. Yeah? It looks nice. Uh, so all this, this whole triangle here, in in the gromov hausdorff in the manifold, not manifold, but in the matrix space, uh, Gromov matrix space of matrix spaces, this whole triangle here, it makes sense as a subset there. And uh, I don't know, it is goes homeomorphically to something there. Now, there are very interesting things to note here in this flow. Uh, we could, with that, with this theorem here, we could uh, classify all the collapses. We could identify them. And if you see all collapsing uh, points here, this is very curious thing that happens is that these are somehow the only points that are Riemannian manifolds here. So the Ricci flow, it will never collapse uh, to a Finsler manifold. So all of these points here, if I'm not wrong, they are Finsler matrix. These are manifolds with Finsler matrix, but it avoids all of them and goes to these ones, the Riemannian manifolds. Moreover, which I find more curious, is that the Ricci float avoids uh, a big collapse as well, as well. So if you see these extremal points here, so these extremal extreme points here, they happen when two coordinates goes to zero. So if you take the O, it's the most clear is that x equals to y equals to zero. So only z equal to one. But when you take m1 and m2 in this type two manifolds, uh, they do not generate a subalgebra. They are not a subalgebra. And when you bracket it, uh, you end up that the, the whole g uh, collapses. So in all of these points, o, p, and q, uh, you have collapse, complete collapse of the manifold. And this particular uh, property also happens in the type one scenario. In the type one scenario also, these extreme points here, they are uh, repellers, they are source. And uh, so the Ricci flow is just running away from it. And on the other hand, it only have two limiting points here, L, M, L and M. And why is that? Because if you go to this point here, which is also, uh, which happens in the type two, in the type two case, this point here, it have, it is one subgroup. It's a proper subgroup. So this K is here. 
is the M1 uh, summand, and uh, you get a subgroup K plus M1. In the type one scenario, uh, this M1 here, it's M1 plus K is not a subgroup. And when you bracket it, you get the whole algebra. So it would, this point here would collapse to the whole, would collapse the whole manifold. And it just uh, misses, the flow just misses this point. And it's very interesting, it's not a source, nothing. And uh, it's just uh, uh, neglected, neglected, which is very interesting. I find it very interesting. And the other very interesting thing to, to see here is that uh, here you miss one of the collapsing points compared to the type two case. And also you miss one in numbers, you miss one Einstein metric. Yeah, here you have two collapsing uh, points and three Einstein metric. Here you have three collapsing points and four Einstein metrics. I wonder if there is some relation. That would be really interesting to know. And uh, that's it, I think. How much time? We would have we three are... more minutes. Three more minutes, yes. Uh, yes, so in the type one case, also these limits here, they are have different nature from each other. So the L and the M, in the L, the point L, in the point M, you have a symmetric space, as in the type two case, they are all symmetric spaces, but the L is not symmetric, it's a, what you call a Borel de Cimental space. It is a, a homogeneous manifold with full rank, where the subgroup has full rank, and they were classified by Borel and the, the Zibentab. And uh, these are the, the manifolds that you get on the type one. So remember that the type one are the exceptional flag manifolds. And you would get these symmetric spaces or these Borel de Zibentab spaces. Uh, uh, in the end, I would like to say that, so these are, my first observations, that the collapses that we get uh, here with the projected homogeneous flow, they are in nature very different from what you get with the volume normalization. So there is a very nice paper of Christoph, Christoph Bonn from 2015, Commentari, that uh, he studies uh, the homogeneous homogeneous rich flow, but if you do the some normalization on it, some kind of volume normalization, you not get some collapse like this. Instead, what would happen here, you do like that, what would happen is that what whatever it would be going to zero here in our case, uh, you keep it, you renormalize the flow in a way that this will not go to zero. Let's say it goes to some bounded thing, but everything else will explode. So the only information that remains uh, is this, this thing that would collapse in our project flow. And he proves that uh, this limit is uh, a type one singularity and uh, therefore it is Einstein. So this is a, uh, an information that we don't get from the, the projected flow because we are not analysts <laughs> as well. Uh, that the subgroup that is collapsing here in the limit, the metric of this subgroup would be an Einstein metric. Uh, but on the other hand, we get the the collapsed manifold. So they are complementary informations. And this is very interesting, yeah? So the projected flow gives you a complementary information compared to the uh, a more usual renormalization. Yeah, so from Bonn, you get this subconvergence. 
And uh, it says that would converge if the number of Einstein metrics are finite, which uh, motivates their finiteness conjecture, which I find it very interesting. And uh, in some other time, I will talk more about some program to, to tackle it, not to tackle, but at least to approach it. All right, and that's what I want to say for today. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Enrique and the organizers and uh, all the audience. All right, thanks. <laughs> right, everyone, we have, uh, we have five minutes for questions. It's very interesting, so. Please go ahead if you have questions. Um, yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, this Borel spaces yes. that you got in type one was um, as, as limits, are they isotropy reducible? Um, I think so. Uh, so as I mentioned, I was, I entered in the project later and uh, I was working the collapse part. So I am the metric geometry whiz of the group, not the algebraic part. Uh, I think so because, because they come from, I mean, it's compact and decay. I think so. They are irredu reducible and have uh, they are maximal subgroups. So these are oh. maximal subgroups here. All, all of them have maximal rank. Yes, I think maximal so. Subgroups. They are maximal oh. subgroups. Oh, okay, okay. And they have so the they same are... rank. The rank of K and the rank of G is the same. Yeah, but that doesn't imply that they are maximal. I, I mean, um, no, 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 no. <laughs> they are maximal and this. Order. Okay, okay, very interesting. So they admit one a global maximum for the scalar curvature. So that's that's very interesting. Really? Um, nice. Yes, yes. That's one sealer's result that if. H is a, is a maximal subgroup of G, then you get the global maximum. And so, um, yes. another, so another question. This. Yeah. Maybe it's, I, I mean, did you try uh, this for um, generalized Wallach spaces? Generalized Wallach. Are they homogeneous? Yes, yes, and they also have uh, three isotropy summons. They all uh, have. So, ha have you worked on, no. on on those spaces no. with this method? Okay. No, 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 we didn't. Mm -hmm. And do you have an example where uh, where the Ricci flow goes to a non-Riemannian? Space. The Ricci flow, no, no. I think I always go to Riemannian. So if the singularity is type one, then it's a soliton. I think. I think. But I mean, is 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 it a conjecture that it will always be the case that the the limits will be Riemannian, or we don't know that. Or, I mean, I don't know that. <laughs> so I all know. the it, I would know? conjecture that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I would conjecture that, yes. Uh-huh, okay. Okay, okay. So, yeah, a, a nice place to try is, is this generalized Wallach. They, they were studied with other methods by Krisikos and Anastasio. Uh -huh. But, I see. okay. Yes. Nice, very thank nice you very talk. much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, maybe I can ask you something. Um, so if you go back to the table where you have your your examples of, of possible G mod H in their dimensions, 
Yeah. This one. So yes. as you know, I, I only I only know one question, right? Which I ask regardless of context. So mm -hmm. uh, um, when you look at the eight-dimensional and six-dimensional cases, especially so the low, the lowest, yeah. the lowest uh, possible uh, examples. Yes. Um, this. I would be wondering, especially in the case of G two mod um, SO four. Um, this I suspect these manifolds are they admit spin seven structures, right? Interesting. Huh. Because are they are they spheres? Is this is this a sphere? Are they spheres? Is this, is this over the eight sphere? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think so. G two over S O four. I think it's like something that uh, parameterizes quaternionic structures. I don't hmm. No, no, they are not spheres. No, no spheres. No. That's fair. I think G two right. over S O three. No, because the, the dimension is eight. So, no. Okay, but uh, regardless. So, um, the point is. Uh, we don't know much about flows of of spin seven structures, right? So I, I think these manifolds, I mean it's G two and SO four, they they must carry spin seven structures, and a spin seven structure will determine a metric. I would be wondering if one could um, if one could uh, ask the following question: So, which flow of spin seven structures causes, say, your flow of um, of Riemannian metrics? Right causes your Ricci flow. Uh, maybe that's a maybe that's a workable question, right? Um, um, the reason being, we we don't know uh, uh, of many. In fact, uh, uh, I've I've just worked on a particular flow of spin seven structures, but there are no flow interesting flows of spin seven structures studied in the literature. None, right? I see. So um, uh, I'm tr I'm trying to shoot in all possible directions to see if we can find interesting flows of spin seven structures. They're very hard to vary. Yeah, I and, understand. Uh, I interesting question. So uh, yes. by looking at the uh, relation, right? Uh, so so the spin seven structures define a Riemannian metric in a in a prescribed way. It's yes. ambiguous, of course. It's ambiguous, of course. Uh, but uh, we know how to flow them in a natural way in the same isometric class. So that would be a sort of transversal slice. But if mm -hmm. you are genuinely deforming the metric, then I suspect mm -hmm. it, it might be interesting to try and see uh, what the formations of spin seven structure are sort of lying above your flow mm -hmm. of, of, of the metric. I see. Uh, I would ask if every metric, so this is, this is the the uh, the flow. I would ask you if every metric defines a spin seven structure. Um, um, so if I give you a metric, does it define a spin yeah. seven structure? Um, well, that 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 would depend on how your your specific manifold admits a spin seven structure at all. We we would have mm -hmm. to look into it, but I mean I don't know any mathematics. You have to ask Andres Moreno any any mathematical questions. Uh, okay, I, I, <laughs> only philosophy. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, what, what I was trying to say is um, you have a very nice flow in these, um, and I'm not even talking about the six dimensional fellow. But uh, well, so first of all, here, here here's a simpler question. Does yes. G two mod S O four admit spin seven structures in any natural way? Right, homogeneous. Okay. I mean, I mean homogeneous spin seven structure. Here's 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 mm -hmm. something we can just set out and 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 try and figure out. Right, I think yeah. it does. I really think it does. Uh, maybe think, yes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a representation theory question. You yeah, have to take exactly. the isotropy, which is maybe irreducible, so only one metric, but it may admit, yeah, spin seven. This is, yeah, it's a representation theory, but you can do it. I, I, I agree. Yeah. So, so, so that's how we should proceed. Maybe you know, that's is there a fixed spinner by some of the action or something? You know, you, 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 you look into this, but then, 
I, I really suspect this really has a has a face of a, of a something that has spin seven structures, and then even even parameterizing all possible spin seven structures would be interesting. Even parameterizing all isometric spin seven structures on a given one would be interesting already. Uh, yes, so what I'm mm. what I suspect I'm trying to say is that you guys have a lot of intuition on these flag manifests. Uh, but you don't seem to look at them from the perspective of geomet special geometric structure. So, so what I'm trying to say is that maybe, maybe there are some really easy questions that you 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 can answer. Just especially Lino, he has a lot of intuition into these guys. Uh, yes. uh, you know, uh, so so can you build can you build the spin seven structure by, just by using the ingredients that are already there? You know, some some canonical mm -hmm. some canonical structures that are already there. Uh, you know, it's a G two, so there's a there's a three form canonical three form sitting somewhere in there, wedging with some one form sitting somewhere else. That'll give you a full form. You know, it it shouldn't be a very hard game to play to to begin with, and then and then seeing how you can vary these fellows in the same isometric class, and then ideally in in uh, in uh, by varying the isometric class in a very very loose way. Kind of what yes. uh, Andres Moreno, Eric Lebo, and myself have been doing on the seventh sphere for for G two structures. There, we give some sort of explicit parameterization, realizing various isometric classes. Uh, it seemed, and then study some natural flow. Uh, I think, I think it, it would be interesting. Like if, if you even find one spin seven structure, then what's the harmonic flow for this fellow and so on? Uh, so it, it seems to me that. That maybe looking at the same spaces from a perspective of uh, special geometric structures will give you other interesting ODEs you can solve. Yes, yeah, I agree with you. It seems interesting. Uh, yeah. So this, so just correcting one thing I'm saying, uh, this is not the flow of the the eighth dimensional because the eighth dimensional is just a, a collapsing point here. Yeah, it's, it's on M here. Uh, so I think this is uh, only one summand. So it uh, well, if it has only one summand, then it doesn't have even a, a diagram like this. Just one point. Yeah, you need three, like, right? Um, or two at least to have dynamics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Enrique, why why do you want to a uh, flow for spin seven generating? The Ricci flow because this is the Ricci flow for the metrics. Yeah. For instance, in the in the G two Laplacian flow, you don't have that, right? You you Fair never point. generate the Ricci flow. You are close, but it's not right. I mean. Fair point. Uh, I suppose you want uh, uh, very heuristically. I I would think I would like flows which are weakly parabolic. That's what I would like, and I suspected that if this is you flow in the structure, but coupled with uh, a flow which is parabolic, then it might be parabolic as well. Uh, 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 if you, you know, if you if you gauge your way by the uh, isometric deformations, and then you just you're just deforming across isometric classes, you could make it sort of parabolic. And uh, but may, maybe I'm maybe I'm daydreaming. You're right. You're right. The analogy is not. But, but again, but, but but let me argue against what I just told you. So uh, the Laplacian flow doesn't really make sense for spin seven structure in the same way that it does. So we need to find good flows. That's the we don't have any good flows for spin seven structures. Uh, whereas for G two we have at least two, <laughs> uh, which change the metric, and then we have the harmonic flow which flows within the same isometric class. But for spin seven uh, uh, structures, the the Laplacian is the wrong way to go. Uh, so how do you find what's the best spin seven structure in a given class? We we, we don't know. Uh, uh, there are no good flows choosing the, the the beautiful ones from the ugly ones. And and this this is troubling me more and more. Okay. Uh, but the harmonic flow, your harmonic flow, well, it, uh, it works. Well, my harmonic flow, seven. it works, but it works mm -hmm. within an isometric class. So yes, yes so. it chooses yes, the so. most beautiful spin seven structure in a given isometric class, uh, okay. if and when it converges, right? Uh, which, by the way, one could look at that in the eighth sphere. I'm inviting everyone to do it because it's an open problem. But uh, uh, what I'm, uh, uh, the, 
but but what, what we don't have is uh, any natural flow which actually varies the isometric class and this is hmm. very frustrating to me yes Perfect. well let me may, may i may i make some a comment about that in yeah. if if you take one of these isotropy irreducible homogeneous spaces mm -hmm. of dimension eight um and and you you are lucky and you have a spin seven structures then mm -hmm. any flow will be isometric because there is only one metric right i mean uh, oh if if the homogeneous space is already isotropy reducible then there is only one metric so the flow must be isometric uh, oh so the flow will be the harmonic flow Yes, well, maybe not, but it, mm. it will stay because there is only one class of isometry. There is only one isometry class. Okay, so fair point. And the same for fair G2, point. of course. The same for G2. You you may have isotropy reducible and many G2 structures, but any flow will the behavior of any flow will be isometric because the metric doesn't have where to go. Fair point. So do you think this is worth in investing some time or maybe we're just going to find some some block? No, no. Yes, it is this. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a good place to start this isotropy reducible for a spin seven, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. OK, but thank you. Jorge. Yeah, thank you. yeah. So what Jorge is saying is that you're going to get another uh, type of uh, of isometric flow, but then we could even compare. Is it the harmonic flow? Uh, is, it, is it maybe something else or, or what, what is happening there? Are there two notions of a most beautiful structure in a class? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. You, that's you just may, one. Yeah, yeah, you may have uh, many spin seven, many very different and still one metric. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, Lohan. So, if you want to think about it further, we can uh, we can maybe have a look at this. Uh, again, again, I, I don't know anything about 112 dimensions, right? That's much too hard. I can I can barely count to 10. So, uh, so if you can help me uh, <laughs> in the lower dimensions, I think I'll be more in my comfort zone. I can barely count to nine. So, <laughs> that's fine. Eight is below that is below nine. So, I think we're good. Yes. Okay, man. That was very interesting. Cheers. Shall we thank uh, Luhan again? Thank you, everyone. thank you very much.